everybody and welcome to Fly High. In this video we're going to take a look at the fundamentals of flying a helicopter. Recently we covered how a helicopter actually works. If you missed that video, here's the link. I suggest you go and watch it first as it covers some important information that will help you understand this new video. Most flight schools or flying clubs offer discovery flights and trial lessons where you can experience what it's like to sit in the pilot seat and take the controls of a helicopter. This is very often done in the most popular civil helicopter in the world, the Robinson helicopter. 50 years ago, Frank Robinson had the dream to design and produce a simple, affordable, high quality personal helicopter. With over 13,000 helicopters delivered worldwide since 1979, you are very likely to fly a Robinson on a discovery flight. Here we are in the cockpit of a Robinson R44. The pilot sits on the right hand side, so this will be your seat. The left hand side has removable dual controls which will be in place for your instructor to use. There are three main flight controls. You have the collective control and the throttle, the cyclic and the anti-torque pedals at your feet. The collective control is in your left hand. It controls the pitch angle of the blades, creating more or less lift, making the helicopter go up or down. Pull the collective up and the helicopter goes up. Push the collective down and the helicopter goes down. Also in your left hand is the throttle, which controls the RPM, that's the rotations per minute, of the engine and the rotors. Rolling it onto the left increases the RPM and rolling it to the right reduces the RPM. A correlator system, as well as a governor, keeps the RPM consistent throughout the entire flight. You may feel the throttle twisting slightly during the flight and you need to keep a loose grip on the throttle so that it can operate freely. The cyclic is in your right hand and controls the attitude of the rotor disc, giving the direction and speed of travel. The Robinson cyclic has a T-bar design, meaning the control is centrally placed and each pilot has a cyclic grip. This up and down movement is only used to pass the cyclic from one pilot to the other and to find a comfortable position. It has absolutely no control over the helicopter. To fly forwards, you gently push the cyclic forwards, the helicopter's nose drops and it moves forwards. Gently pull the cyclic backwards, or as we say aft, the helicopter's nose will rise, it will slow down and eventually stop. Pull the cyclic aft a little bit more and the helicopter will hover backwards. Push the cyclic left or right and the helicopter will lean or roll to the side. If you're in a hover, it will hover sideways with the nose pointing in the same direction. Adding left or right cyclic when you're in forward flight, it'll give you a nice leaning turn, much like when you're riding a bike. The pedals at your feet control the direction that the nose of the helicopter is pointing in otherwise known as the yaw axis. If you're in a hover or taxiing very slowly and you push on the left pedal, the helicopter is going to rotate to the left. And if you push on the right pedal, it will rotate to the right. In forward flight, we use them to keep the helicopter in trim. During flight, they will be rarely nicely lined up next to each other. They will generally be one slightly more forward than the other. They move together. Pushing one forwards will make the other one go backwards. To recap, the collective makes the helicopter go up and down, the throttle makes the rotors turn, the cyclic gives us the direction of travel, and the pedals make the helicopter rotate. The art of flying is coordinating these controls harmoniously. Okay, so now you know what the controls do, you're ready to fly. Let me tell you how a typical first flight may roll out. After a pre-flight check of the helicopter, a safety briefing and our seat belts fastened, we'll go through the startup procedure following the checklist. With the engine running, we get to a point where we open the throttle and the governor takes over. With your left hand on the throttle, you'll feel it rolling on automatically. The rotor blades speed up to just over 100% RPM. Here you can see we have the rotors turning at full speed and the helicopter is still on the ground. We pull up on the collective, adding lift to the blades and the helicopter lifts up into a hover. Now the helicopter is hovering, facing the hangar and the runway or the takeoff area is over to the right. So we push the right pedal to turn the nose in the direction we would like to go. 
we gently push the cyclic forwards and have the helicopter hover forwards following the yellow lines towards the runway. Here you can see the student pilot following along by ever so slightly touching the controls. Now you're probably wondering why we take off on a runway if a helicopter can do vertical takeoff. It's mostly for safety reasons. Whenever there is a runway and it's possible to use it, we choose the runway. In a very unlikely event of an engine problem during takeoff, we'd have the whole runway in front of us to land on and the helicopter will have the necessary speed and RPM settings to land safely without an engine in an auto rotation. Here we're lined up on the runway and ready for departure. The art of flying is coordinating all the controls, so to take off we're going to push the cyclic forwards to hover forwards. Keep pushing it forwards to pick up speed and then we lift the collective to climb into the air. The takeoff will most probably be done by the instructor, but as soon as the helicopter is at a good safety height, the student is invited to take the controls. You need to try and stay nicely relaxed. Flying doesn't work well if you're all tense and uptight. Take a moment to find a comfortable position, particularly for your right hand. The controls are hypersensitive. These machines are controlled with tiny but very frequent movements. The inputs are so small, we can compare them to the movements you make when writing with a pen. When writing, you place your hand on the table to hold it steady and you only move your fingers in very small movements to control the pen for nice handwriting. It would be very difficult to control the pen with a whole arm. Same goes for the cyclic. You need to place your hand on your leg to keep it stable and only move your fingers in very small movements to control the cyclic. Just to reassure you, your instructor will continue to guide you with his voice and keep his hands and feet real close to the controls ready to take over whenever needed. Right, here we're in mid-air and the idea in this introductory lesson is to fly straight and level and not as if you're on a roller coaster. If you drive a car, you're on the road, so it's easy, you just follow the road. But how do you do this in a helicopter? We will be in visual flight rules. This means that we are not in the clouds, we're flying with visual references, and just like you would when you drive a car, you're looking outside of the aircraft almost all of the time. You just check the instruments from time to time to confirm what is happening outside. In the beginning, we will mostly concentrate on looking outside and the instruments will come later. In a Robinson, to fly level, we have this very useful instrument that is placed directly in our line of vision that you can use as a reference. It's actually a compass, but don't worry too much about the direction it's showing for now. Your instructor will keep the helicopter straight and level while you memorize very precisely where the compass is positioned in reference to the horizon. If you are tall, it could be slightly below the horizon. If you are short, it could be slightly above, but generally it's somewhere on or close to the horizon. Your job is to keep it there by using forward and aft cyclic inputs. If you see that the compass has moved way above the horizon, it means your helicopter has a nose up position, it's climbing and slowing down. Adjust the cyclic slightly forwards to bring the compass back to the right position on the horizon. But if it goes too far and you see that the compass has moved down below the horizon, it means your helicopter has a nose down position and so it's gaining speed and descending. You will need to pull back on the cyclic to bring the nose up again to bring the compass back to the right position on the horizon. Take your time getting used to the extent of the movements and adjust them to keep the compass on the horizon and the helicopter stable. Next, the idea is to fly in a straight line and not zigzag all over the place. For this, we'll use the central bar as a visual reference. Look as far ahead as you can and find a big landmark, for example a mountain, a forest, a road or something like that. Try to keep it in the same position by using left and right cyclic inputs. If you are in a turn, the central bar will be tilting to one side. Here you can see an example of us turning right. If your landmark moves from the right side of the windshield to the left, it means you're turning to the right and you need to add left cyclic until the landmark is back in its original position. Lastly, 
you want to make sure your helicopter is flying with its nose straight into the relative wind and that you're not side slipping or skidding. To keep its nose straight, you use the pedals. To know if you are straight or not, we have these two pieces of string on the outside of the windshield. You want to have one piece of string on each side of the central bar. If the two are on the same side, you need to push on the opposite pedal. In this case, the strings are on the right side, so we push on the left pedal to bring them back to the center. Here's a hint. When you have enough forward speed, your helicopter is aerodynamically designed to keep itself nice and straight, so you will need very little or no input if you keep your feet nice and light on the pedals. You need very little effort on the controls. If you find that a pedal feels hard to push, it's because you have the other foot pushing down on the other pedal. You have to release one pedal to push the other. We spend a good part of the flight practicing flying straight and level. We do some turns, climbs and descents, and fly at different speeds. Then eventually we make our way back to the airport and land. Hovering is well known to be the most difficult part of flying a helicopter. Your instructor will probably have you try each control individually at first, while he or she controls the rest. For this exercise, the helicopter will be positioned facing a reference point, such as a tree or the windsock. We'll start with the pedals only. Keep your eyes on the reference, and as soon as you have the controls, you'll find that the helicopter will certainly start turning right or left. As soon as you see the helicopter turning in one direction, you have to push the pedal opposite to the direction of the rotation. If the helicopter turns right, push the left pedal to prevent it from turning and even bring it back to face the reference point. Once you've mastered the pedals, we can do small rotation exercises making 180 degree turns or complete 360 degree rotations. Afterwards, the instructor will take over all three controls facing the reference point for the next exercise, the collective. On his instructions, you pull the collective gently upwards to make the helicopter go up a few meters and then gradually lower the collective to slow down the climb, come to a halt and then very gently bring the helicopter back down again. Once you've mastered that, to hover you need to try and keep the helicopter at a constant height. You'll find that it is necessary to slightly adjust the collective constantly with very small inputs. For example, if the wind accelerates, the helicopter will go up, so you have to lower the collective a tiny bit, and then vice versa, when the wind slows down again, the helicopter is going to go down, so you'll have to pull the collective slightly up again. After this exercise, the instructor will take over all three controls again and then let you try the cyclic. You'll see this is the sportiest part of the hover. It's very important to keep your eyes fixed on the reference point far ahead and not look at the ground in order to detect the slightest change in the attitude of the helicopter. Any change in its horizontal position results in the helicopter moving. As soon as it starts to lean to one direction, it will move in that direction. If it leans to the left, it will hover to the left. If it leans to the right, it will hover to the right. If the nose drops, it will hover forwards. If the nose rises, it will hover backwards. There will always be a very small delay of about a second or half a second between the moment it starts to lean or tilt and the moment in which it starts to move. The goal is to correct the attitude at this precise moment before it moves. You need to act very quickly but with tiny movements. If, despite all your concentration and effort, the helicopter moves, don't necessarily try to stop it or bring it back to the original position. You could land up doing a backwards and forwards motion. Just try to get it horizontal again and you'll find the helicopter will eventually stop. And of course, the art of hovering is to coordinate all three controls, so once mastered individually, we'll start to combine two of them and then all three. Successful hovering can take several sessions, so don't be discouraged and keep on trying. By now, you have probably understood that even if you have a good understanding of how to use the controls, it's not just a matter of finding the right position and holding it. No, you can't take your hands off the controls like you can in an aeroplane. You are constantly adjusting the controls, not only to make the helicopter do what you'd like it to do, but against outside elements like wind 
or a passenger shifting in his seat. And when you adjust one control, there are secondary effects that need to be counteracted by adjusting another control, which in turn will give secondary effects on something else that will need to be counteracted by adjusting another control. It's never ending. And that, my friends, is a subject for a future episode. Subscribe so you don't miss out. See you next time on Fly High. Thank you.